Okay. Excellent. Looks like it's working. Okay. All right. So, Cassandra, uh, very good. yeah, just checking that everything yeah, is <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so she, she will talk about nonlinear damped specially periodic readers and the emergence of certain like rogue waves. Okay, so um, yes, so I'd like to thank Anadi for the invitation to speak at this workshop, and also I'd like to acknowledge my 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 uh, co-author Alvaro Islas on this work. And um, the talk will today be based off of a recent paper in in Physica D, uh, related to this you know interesting what we thought was an interesting phenomena, the emergence of these soliton like rogue waves. Okay, so. Ah, okay. No. Why isn't it? And it was moving before. Oh, jeez. I'm sorry. Uh, for some reason, it's not. Uh, it's not uh, moving. So just a just a second. Yeah, you have to click on the screen again or something. Is it, are you there? Yes, I'm here, but for some reason, I mean, it worked before. Uh, okay. Now it's working, yeah. Yeah, okay, so it, it uh, went to a different mode of, of using the mouse pad instead of the arrows. Okay, right. I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, so um, okay, to, so to set up the, the framework, uh, in deep water, rogue waves may appear in a regular wave field due to the modulational instability of the background state and nonlinear focusing of uh, uncorrelated waves in a localized region of the sea. The nonlinear Schrodinger equation is one of the simplest models that captures the modulational instability and self-focusing of deep water gravity waves. And it possesses uh, large families of special solutions which exhibit the qualitative properties of rogue waves, that they're localized, transient, and steep. And so the simplest solutions uh, used to model rogue waves are the heteroclinic orbits of unstable Stokes waves, also known as spatially periodic breathers. And so this is your Arcbetti of breather and, and the generalizations. Okay. And so um, it's well known that the Stokes solution is unstable to long wavelength perturbations and has in unstable modes where in is the largest integer, uh, less than AL over pi. And each of these unstable modes has a heteroclinic orbit characterized by the wave number mu. Uh, and in the first uh, two plots, uh, we have the amplitudes of two distinct single mode SPBs that are associated with the first and second unstable mode of the underlying Stokes wave respectively. Uh, Multi-mode SPBs, uh, can be obtained by iterating the Beckland transformation and have the following form. And in the third plot, we have a uh, two-mode SPB, which uh, is obtained by uh, choosing the parameters in the, in the expression uh, rho and tau, choosing them so that the, the modes have coalesced. Okay. So a, a more realistic exploration of deep water Wave dynamics can be achieved with a nonlinear damped higher order in a less equation. Um, here, you know, H is the Hilbert transform of F. Uh, when beta is equal to zero, uh, this is a Hamiltonian version of the DISTI equation, and we have the uh, higher order dispersion and nonlinear terms, as well as the, the Hilbert transform term, which is the signature of the DISTI equation, and uh, which reflects the wave induced, the presence of the wave induced mean flow. When beta is non zero, uh, the equation is models damping of the wave induced mean flow. And uh, we have included it uh, in our study since, uh, since the, the inclusion of uh, nonlinear damping allows for permanent frequency downshifting, which is another important phenomena related to the modulational instability and which is observed in lab experiments and field data. And so to get an idea 
of the effect of the nonlinear damping term. Uh, in the figure, we have the uh, spatial distribution of the amplitude u of xt at a given time versus the, the Hilbert transform term, which is the red, uh, the red dashed line or curve. And we see that nonlinear damping uh, is significant only near the crest of the envelope, and it's very localized in, in space and time uh, where you have strongly, a strongly modulated uh, wave train. And so as mentioned in, in a comparative study, uh, the nonlinear damped higher order NLS was shown to be the most accurate model for predicting permanent downshift observed in a set of laboratory experiments. And so today, you know, we our goal is we investigate the stabilization of the spatially periodic breathers and related rogue wave activity and the framework of the nonlinear damped higher order NLS. The initial data is generated using exact SPBs of the NLS equation at time t naught. And so we vary uh, t naught to allow initialization at different stages of the development of the modulational instability. And we vary n the number of unstable modes of the background. So in uh, the spirit of earlier work of, of Ercolani, Forrest, and McLaughlin, we use the Floquet spectral theory of the NLS equation to characterize the perturbed dynamics in terms of nearby solutions of the NLS equation. And we address uh, the following questions. What are the distinguishing features of the damped higher order NLS flow as determined by the flow case spectrum? Which integrable instabilities are excited by the damp flow and which NLS states are relevant to modeling the perturbed flow? So further, you know, how does the damped higher order NLS uh, evolution and its flow case spectral decomposition and road wave activity depend on T naught. Okay, so it's uh, recall that the uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation arises as the compatibility condition of the Zakharov uh, Shabbat system, and that general periodic solutions of the NLS can be represented in terms of a set of nonlinear modes whose stability is determined by the flow case spectrum of the spatial part of the Zakharov Shabbat system. And uh, to determine the flow case spectrum, let psi be a fundamental solution matrix of the Zakharov Shabbat system. The principal object in flow K theory is the flow K discriminant delta, which is the trace of the monodromy matrix and which governs the growth or, or determines the growth of the eigenfunctions as they're mapped across a period. Uh, the, the spatial operator is not self-adjoint, and so in terms of delta, the spectrum is given by all complex lambda such that delta is real and bounded between negative and positive two. So um, the spectrum consists of bands of continuous spectrum and the discrete set of periodic antiperiodic spectrum where delta is equal to plus or minus two. The simple points of the spectrum are the endpoints of the bands of spectrum and located within the bands of spectrum are two important spectral elements, the critical points of spectrum uh, where d delta d lambda is zero and the double points of the periodic spectrum, uh, which are uh, degenerate eigenvalues of the discrete, uh, you know, discrete uh, spectrum. Um, so there's an important distinction between real and complex double points as the, real com as the real double points correspond to stable inactive modes and the complex double points uh, typically correspond to linear instabilities of periodic solutions. So in this figure, the X's are indicating the double points in the spectrum and you would have complex uh, critical point uh, where the, you have this transverse intersection of the bands of spectrum and the little bubbles are the simple points indicating the ends of points. Um, and so uh, these spectral elements are illustrated with the Stokes wave um, uh, given here uh, along with its discriminant delta. And so we see that the spectrum uh, consists of the entire real axis uh, along with a band along the imaginary axis from minus IA to positive IA, IA ending at these discrete simple points, uh, lambda equals plus or minus IA. And so there are a infinite number of real double points uh, along the uh, real axis. 
And there's a finite number of complex uh, double points where uh, the number of complex double points n is equal to the largest integer less than al over pi. And so this is the same condition that you had for the Benjamin Fair instability. So, um, so at each of these complex double points, you can construct a uh, heteroclinic orbit using a Beckland transformation. And the important feature of the Beckland transformation is that it's isospectral. So the spectrum for the Stokes wave and for the single mode SPB and the double mode or the two mode SPB, um, they are identical. Okay, so in the um, higher order NLS experiments, uh, critical points become significant because the higher order terms break symmetry in the problem. And once complex double points split, they do not reform. And what you obtain are, are complex critical points in the evolution. And um, to, to uh, illustrate or to see uh, the effect of perturbations on complex, complex critical points, we consider this uh, even three-phase solution of the NLS uh, given here, and which has a corresponding, uh, what's colloquially called a cross-state spectrum. And in this spectrum, you have a complex critical point on the imaginary axis where, where the bands intersect. And so if you, if you take this solution, uh, if you take initial data for this solution and you perturb it with an even perturbation, you will produce, you'll simply produce a cross state with a slightly different or delta difference in the band length. And so U naught and U delta will stay delta close in time. Uh, however, asymmetric perturbations of initial data can split uh, the, critical point in two distinct ways, and a left or right traveling breather is ob obtained depending upon whether the upper band of spectrum is in the first or second quadrant. And in this case, uh, U naught and U delta diverge. And so the numerical uh, experiments suggest that the complex critical points are related to weak instabilities. And so the question is, what is the nature of the instability? So uh, to find uh, to, to corroborate, really, the numerical experiments, we examine the spectrum for small time for damped SPB data. And to do so, we find that the linearized initial conditions for the single and two-mode SPB are of this form. Then for small time H, uh, we obtain the following first-order approximations to the nonlinear damped uh, SPB data. And here, the coefficients uh, all uh, are depend upon uh, H and the uh, nonlinear damping and higher order NLS parameters epsilon and beta for uh, S equals I and J. And so, so for simplicity, uh, we suppress the explicit dependence on epsilon, uh, beta, and H, and we let epsilon sub S tilde equal epsilon and we have data of the following form where Q can be zero or one, depending upon whether a one or two mode SPB is under consideration. To, to find the spectrum for damped SPB data, we assume the perturbation expansion for the eigenvalue and um, eigenfunctions. And we find that the corrections given here at order epsilon are non-zero only if n is equal to i or j. All other double points do not have an order epsilon correction. Further, we find that for a one mode SPB at order epsilon to the n, only uh, lambda sub n j will split. So lambda sub l, the double point lambda sub l, uh, if l is not equal to mj, will not split. And uh, in the case of the two mode SPB, both complex double points will split at order epsilon. And uh, it's important to note that the expression for the correction implies uh, that the lambda sub one squared is, 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 is complex. And so the splitting is asymmetric, unlike in the even case. And so two disjoint bands will be obtained corresponding to either a, a left or right traveling mode. And so this is the simple example shown before where you have you had just a single 
uh, here you would have had a single double point, which which split rather than a, a criti uh, critical point that we considered before. Okay, so in the numerical experiments, the uh, in unstable mode re refers to the solutions initialized near a Stokes wave with in unstable modes, uh, and the initial data is generated using exact SPBs of the NLS equation at T naught. And so we are now subscripting with epsilon beta to indicate solutions to the perturbed equation. Uh, we're varying N and T naught to allow initialization at different stages of the development of the modulational instability and all the uh, experiments and all the experiments, the perturbation parameters are epsilon uh, equals 0 0.05 and beta equals 0 0.2. So uh, the, the principal tool is the Floquet spectral decomposition of the damped data, which is computed at each time t. The presence of complex critical and double points is monitored, as well as the lengths of the bands of spectrum in the upper half plane. Uh, the length of a band with endpoints lambda sub n and lambda sub n is given by gamma. And when tiny bands emerge, we view the corresponding modes of the n phase solution to be qualitatively. Uh, have to qualitatively have a soliton-like structure. So specifically, if one or two of the bands satisfy gamma is less than 0.025, then the spectrum is said to be in a one or two soliton-like configuration. The motivation uh, for the terminology can be seen by considering the uh, three-phase solution, uh, which in this case is a gap state. And so uh, as the elliptic modulus kappa, well, here you actually have uh, K and kappa. K is for the uh, spatial, uh, the functions which depend on space, and, and kappa is for the temporally dependent uh, functions. And so uh, as kappa goes to one and K goes to zero, the uh, gap in the spectrum will close down and a single mode SPB will be obtained. And as kappa goes to zero and k goes to one, a soliton uh, is obtained. Uh, the other diagnostics we use are the strength function, uh, which is the ratio of the maximum uh, in space of the wave amplitude uh, divided by the significant wave amplitude, h sub s, defined as the average wave amplitude of the highest one third of the waves. And a rogue wave occurs at T star if, if the strength uh, function is greater than 2.2 at that time. And so to, to finally, to complement the spectral analysis, we examine the growth of small perturbations in the SPB initial data uh, as measured by the evolution of the H1 norm of the difference of U delta and U. Okay. So um, the, we're only considering today the two unstable mode regime. Uh, and we start with the single mode SPB U1. And in this case, we see here a fairly irregular solution. Uh, and the spectrum at T equals zero, you have the two complex double points given by the, by the red X and the blue box here. And so damping splits uh, these double points, lambda one at order epsilon and lambda two at order epsilon squared asymmetrically, as you see in the, in the third plot here, which is consistent with the short time perturbation analysis of the spectrum. Subsequently, two upper bands, the two upper bands decrease in length and move away from the imaginary axis. At T about five, uh, which is here in the fourth plot, we see that the band in the first quadrant satisfies uh, the criteria uh, gamma less than 0.025, reflecting the emergence of a waveform close to a one soliton-like structure. The strength plot shows that this soliton-like state satisfies the criterion of a rogue wave. <coughs> uh, we find that complex critical points occur intermittently until T is about 14.7. As I mentioned before, double points don't reappear in the spectral evolution. At T about 15.2, a one soliton-like state forms 
and a pro more pronounced rogue wave is observed. So we find that the rogue wave events are determined from the strength plot on the previous page, and they're given by the red bullets or the red dots on the t-axis of the band length plot for gamma sub one. Uh, gamma, sub, gamma sub two wasn't shown because it, it never actually satisfies the uh, criteria for a rogue wave, uh, for a um, rogue wave. So the you see that the last soliton-like spectrum uh, and the last rogue wave occur at t equals 33.8. So each time a rogue wave is observed in the strength plot of U1, the spectrum is in a soliton-like configuration. And finally, um, the uh, D of T saturates uh, by T equals 15.2 in agreement with the stabilization time determined by the last critical point in the nonlinear spectral decomposition of the solution. Okay, so the next uh, the next example we consider is the single mode SPB U2. Uh, U2 is a damped traveling breather exhibiting regular behavior in the first plot uh, in contrast to the irregular behavior of U1 in the two unstable mode regime. Um, the small time perturbation analysis predicts that for U2, damping only splits the complex double point lambda sub two at order epsilon and lambda sub four at order epsilon squared. And so in fact, this actually holds for the duration of the experiment. So you see in the second figure that this is the spectrum at T equals 34.2 and the uh, second double point has split, but the first double point is here uh, marked by the large X is here in the in this upper band of spectrum. And so uh, lambda one, uh, the, which corresponds to a non-resonant mode is observed to translate along the band of spectrum, uh, but never splits. And a distinctive feature of the spectral evolution for U2 is that the solution gains uh, for a while an unstable mode corresponding to lambda three as it moves from the real axis <clears throat> into the upper half complex plane. So you can see actually <coughs> in the very first plot that at the base of this band of spectrum, you have uh, a nearby double point and at, uh, T equals 44, it has moved onto the uh, band of spectrum. And so, um, so this is, uh, this is uh, distinctive for this nonlinear damped uh, nonlinear damping. So uh, rogue waves are not observed in the strength plot uh, in the evolution of U2, and it U2 stabilizes slowly, uh, evolving as a regular but unstable damped multiphase solution until damping eliminates all the complex double points at t equals 188. So you see here at time 188 in the first plot that the first uh, lambda, so the first double point has finally uh, you know, moved down to the real axis. And lambda three uh, had moved uh, earlier in time and then moved away from the band. Um, so this unusual feature is that since lambda one remained intact from the, uh, remained intact for the duration until 188, you would have expected uh, to see growth in the divergence of nearby trajectories, and you would have seen, you would have expected to see it initially. And so, in experiments that don't have non, that have linear damping, for example, you'll see that the growth, you know, just takes off initially, and uh, eventually saturates when when the complex double points are are eliminated by becoming real. Um, and so, you know, I. Uh, an approach to understanding this is to look at the Fourier decomposition of the data. And this shows that there's permanent downshift in the spectral peak. Uh, the spectral peak is the index of the Fourier mode of maximum amplitude at about T equals 40 uh, due to the nonlinear damping. And so if you look at the Fourier mode plot for perturbed uh, SPB data, so you have U2 plus uh, delta cosine mu one. So you've actually seeded the first mode. 
Downshifting appears to inhibit its growth, uh, which is given by the solid red curve here in the, in the Fourier plot. Uh, and it's then expressed at, at higher order. So the, so the question is, what is the role of downshifting and in inhibiting or delaying the growth of instabilities? Um, so uh, finally, the, the last case is the two-mode SPB U12. Um, so again, initially you had two complex double points and the damping splits, both of them now asymmetrically at order epsilon, uh, consistent with the perturbation analysis. And uh, subsequently, two tiny bands of spectrum pinch off from the ima imaginary axis and enter a two soliton like spectral configuration at a t equals 3.5. And the spectrum is in this two soliton like state for an extended period of time uh, until about t equals 18. And the spectral bands um, enlarge, and the evolution of spectrum has the following pattern that both complex double point split to a two soliton-like state, then a one soliton-like state, and finally into a generic in-phase spectrum, which you can see here in the last uh, uh, plot. Okay. Ha. <laughs> okay. Uh. Okay. All right. So, um, the rogue wave ad events are determined from the strength plot. And again, they're given by the red dots on the t-axis of the band length plot for gamma one and gamma two. And when a rogue wave occurs, the spectrum is in either a two, you know, in the for early time, it's, it's in a two uh, soliton-like state. And then later it's in just a one soliton-like configuration. And, complex critical points or double points do not appear uh, for T greater than zero. There's no significant growth in D of T and nearby trajectories remain close for T greater than zero. And if we let lambda one, lambda two be the midpoints of the bands that have pinched off uh, the two soliton analytical solution obtained by using lambda one and lambda two appears uh, structurally in good agreement near, near the peak uh, with the uh, nonlinear damped uh, SPB. Okay. Okay. So um, here um, we have the dependence of rogue wave activity on the initialization, on this time T naught in the initial data uh, for U12 and um, there's a lot going on in this plot, um, but the main curves to focus on is the blue curve, which is the time a two soliton-like spectrum is first observed. Uh, the yellow curve, which is the time the one soliton-like spectrum is last observed, and the uh, purple curve, which is giving you um, the time the, the last rogue wave is observed. And so um, those are the significant curves because the evolution of spectrum has the following pattern that it goes from one or two soliton-like state to a one soliton-like state to a generic in-phase spectrum. And um, T naught is sampled um, at every, uh, in, in, in increments of uh, 0 0.5. And the red dots at each uh, sample T naught provide a vertical timeline for the rogue wave events. And so correlating uh, these rogue wave events with the time of your last in a soliton-like configuration, we find that for solutions initialized in the early to middle stage of the development of the modulational instability up until T naught is negative uh, 1.5, the, all the rogue waves emerge when the spectrum is in a one or two soliton-like configuration. When uh, and so so these are um, soliton-like; they're not, you know, uh, true solitons. So the the question is, you know, what's the limiting behavior amplitude uh, as the band lengths uh, approach zero? 
And uh, for T naught, when you're initializing near the peak, when T naught's an element of negative one uh, to zero, the last rogue wave occurs after the spectrum has left the soliton-like state, sometimes considerably later. And um, you know, here we have the example for T naught equals zero. And although um, for, for this case, a soliton-like spectrum is last observed at T equals nine, about T equals 9.3, a rogue wave occurs here at, at T equals 47. And the spectrum at T equals 47 um, is just your generic in-phase uh, solution uh, or spectrum. And so when the solutions are initialized as the modulational instability is saturating, there are other possible mechanisms for rogue wave development, such as the superposition of nonlinear modes. And so in conclusion, um, the novel features of the nonlinear damp dynamics are that for U1 and U12, initial data in the two unstable mode regime, tiny bands of complex spectrum uh, may pinch off in the flow cake decomposition of the damped data, reflecting the breakup of the SPB into a waveform close to either a one or two soliton-like structure. And for solutions initialized in the early to middle stage of the development of the modulation instability, all rogue waves occur when the spectrum is in a one or two soliton-like configuration. When the solutions are initialized as the modulational instability is saturating, rogue waves may occur after the spectrum has left a soliton-like state. For the single mode SPBU2, it for a time gains an unstable mode as lambda three moves from the real axis onto a band in the upper half complex plane. And we find that the growth of instabilities associated with non-resonant modes is delayed and expressed at higher order, uh, potentially due to permanent frequency downshifting. Uh, finally, the growth of small perturbations in SPB initial data under the damped higher order and less flow saturates and the solution stabilize once all complex critical points and complex double points vanish in the spectral decompositions. And so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Constance. Yeah, so we're a bit late. I mean, we started also yeah. this last talk a bit Based late. No, no, yeah. I gave you 30 minutes, but uh, is there some quick questions? Maybe people now want to go to the tea time, but thank you again, yes. Constance, for, for this talk and everybody for the afternoon session. Thank you. Okay, thank you.